Thank you. I hope everybody's well today. I think it's probably early evening for you in, in Poland at this point. Yes. So thank you for taking some time out of your afternoon, evening, maybe away from your family. I, I truly appreciate you spending some time with us here today. Um, yes, my name is John Thompson. I've been involved in advanced analytics, data, artificial intelligence for 37 years. I started out uh, way back when running uh, different software companies. I, I've been the head of uh, a number of different companies in the United States and in the UK. Uh, all my work has been focused around data analytics and AI. So I've been an innovator, thought leader, author. Um, my career has had two different, two different threads. I've either been innovating and creating technologies or I've been actually building teams and using those technologies in corporations to drive strategic advantage. So um, analytics and data is everything I do. It's the only thing I do. Uh, I've never really worked in transactional systems or anything like that because I just don't find that very interesting. Um, and that's a personal preference. It's, that's nothing, you know, people at SAP and Salesforce and all those companies really seem to enjoy working on transactional systems. It's not something that I'm very interested in. So I started out way back when, um, you know, in, in creating something, uh, an XML variant called predictive modeling markup language. That was something that we created to facilitate model portability. Uh, we used that technology early on to create fraud alerts inside credit card systems. So I've worked at many of the big credit card companies. I've actually worked across 20 different industries uh, over those almost four decades that I've been working. So. And I think I started about five or six years ago writing books. The first book was called Analytics, How to Win with Intelligence. And that was how to create an analytics function. And the next book was Building Analytics Teams. And that's a global bestseller. It's been in the bestseller list for three years now. And that talks about how to build a team, how to manage a team, how to you know have a, a group of high performance, creative individuals working together to deliver, uh, you know, competitive advantage and uh, money to uh, to an organization. Whenever I'm out uh, at social events and people who don't know me ask me what I do, I say I turn data into money, and that usually gets people's attention pretty quickly. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm open to different kind of questions. If you guys want to ask questions as I'm presenting, you can't take me off my flow. I've, I've talked about this for years and years and years. So uh, when I decided to write this book, Building Analytics Teams, my motivation was that I had built a number of teams inside Dell, inside IBM, inside a, a biopharmaceutical company. And I, I realized that not too many people had actually done it. Not too many people talked about advanced analytics teams and how to get the most out of those those teams. So I thought, well, you know, I'm going to write a book about this. So I started writing the book. I actually wrote the entire book. And then I went and talked to publishers. I, I wrote uh, 100,000 words in three months. So I think that's probably pretty quick for writing a book. And I took it to a couple publishers and they were they were pretty much like, well, who cares about this? Who who wants to manage analytics teams? Does anybody really have an interest in this subject? And I thought, well, I think it's a very interesting subject. So um, I started just writing down my experience. And one of the things that I have come to, and, and I see if it resonates with any of you in the audience, is that an advanced analytics team is, is not like any other development team. It's not like a team that's building a, like I said, a, a customer relationship management system or a you know, a logging system or, you know, a, a, an SAP environment. It's, it's not like that at all. You know, it's usually a group of very creative, highly motivated, very intelligent people. So, you know, you really can't manage them in the way that you can a development team, just a straight up development team where you're doing a function that says, I, I ingest data, I clean data, I post data to a database. You know, for the most part, that's reasonably easy to understand. It's deterministic. You know what functions you're going to do. You know how they work. You can test them. You know what the environments are, the security, and all the different things that you have to work within. When you're 
building an advanced analytics team, there's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of creativity that goes on. And in, in my last job at CSL Bearing, I talked to my team that, you know, if we weren't failing in a substantial number of our projects, we weren't pushing the envelope far enough. We weren't, you know, getting data and integrating it uh, in new and novel ways. We weren't trying new algorithms. We weren't scaling systems in a way that was out on the innovative edge. So I often would have people come and say, this just isn't working. And I'm like, that's okay. You know, that's fine. It's not a problem. We are going to fail at what we're doing. So I think analytics teams to get back to the, the original point is that they're more like teams of artists than they are developers. And that's the way I treat analytics professionals. I'm looking for creativity. I'm looking for daring. I'm looking for risk taking. I'm looking for solutions to actually drive new streams of value. So if you have a group of people that don't, you know, really, and, and this is part of the problem with corporations around the world is that the CEO, the CFO, the COO, they look at analytics teams like they look at IT functions. They're like, oh, well, they deal with computers, so they're part of IT. They should go under the CIO or they should go under the ch uh, chief technology officer. And, and I think that's probably the wrong place to put those teams. At least I, I'm absolutely convinced it's the wrong place to put those teams in an organization. My opinion is that analytics teams are change functions. You know, when you go in and you analyze how you acquire customers or how a factory operates or how a, a, an energy plant works, you're actually going to understand that operation at a very deep level. And you're going to come back with insights on how things should change. So if you're working for someone lower in the organization, they probably don't have a, a agenda or remit to change other functions. If you're working under the CFO or the CIO, highly unlikely likely they're going to care to really change the logistics function of the organization to be much more efficient. So in my opinion, the analytics team should be working for the CEO or the COO, because that is the executive that has the weight, the half, the authority, and the ability to make change in the organization. So, you know, you can't really affect the change that you see if you're working for an executive who does not have that as part of their remit. Another thing about analytics teams is that while they're creative, they're interesting, they do some really cool work, they don't work very well with an agile methodology. Now, usually this is something that gets people, you know, a little bit riled up, but I don't use agile if it's a pure analytics team. Now we at EY, we have lots of developers and lots of developers on my teams and they're developing infrastructure and, and different things like that, which is, as I said, very deterministic. There really isn't any probability that it's going to fail. I mean, we could have mismanaged the project. We could do things wrong. We could elongate the project, but we're going to develop the functionality as advertised. You know, we're going to go from A to B and it's going to get done. Now, if we're actually taking some new technology, some new data, and we're integrating data in an interesting and different way, and we're trying to stretch an algorithm to apply to a new uh, functional area, there's a probability we're going to fail. You know, it might not work. So if you're driving your team in an agile methodology, your analytics team anyway, in an agile methodology, you're pretty much squashing all the creativity out of that team. You can be guaranteed that you are not going to deliver large scale disruptive innovations through your analytics team if you're using Agile. And I've had all sorts of public debates about this with people at events and when I'm up on the stage doing keynote presentations and people are like, oh no, Agile is the way to go. And I'm like, nope, not for analytics. Agile should never be used for analytics. So that's just one of my personal beliefs. So how do you manage an analytics team if you're not going to do it with Agile? 
and you're going to have them fail and you're going to have them run into dead ends. So there's something that I have I that I talk about called the personal project portfolio. And we're talking about data science teams now. We're talking about advanced analytics teams. We're not talking about transactional systems or linear development of deterministic features. So generally in the the last analytics team that I ran at CSL Bearing, each data scientist had three main projects. And those projects would last anywhere from 6 months years in duration. They would have a couple small projects that were a month or two in duration. And then we would have all sorts of service requests that came in that rotated around and got picked up by different data scientists. And every data scientist I've ever worked with, whenever I said, this is your workload, this is what you're going to have, you're going to have eight projects. They all said, this is impossible. This is too hard. I can't do it. And they're all used to being managed in a traditional way. Now, you have to have a certain type of data scientist to do this kind of work, to have these kind of things work well. The two different types of data scientists that I think about are people that I call art artisan data scientists. And they do everything. They do stakeholder management, data acquisition, data, data integration, feature engineering, model development, model validation moving models into in and out of production. They do it all. They own the entire project. Another type of data scientists that I talk about all the time are called factory data scientists. And a piece of work moves through the factory of data scientists. You'll have a group that does data acquisition, another group that does exploratory data analysis, another group that does feature engineering, another group that does model building. And the work moves through the different stations that way. And usually what you have is you have a group of people that you might have outsourced some repetitive work to, and they'll set their teams up in a factory way. And the work will move through those different stations and it, and it works pretty well. You can also set it up in a way that you have a hybrid team. You have a factory team doing the repetitive work and you have an artisan team doing the more creative, interesting exploratory work. And the work flows back and forth between those. So, when you have an artisan team and you've given them a personal project portfolio of seven to eight projects, what happens is that, you know, I had a weekly meeting with all my data scientists where everybody gave a readout on what they were working on. They didn't give a readout on every project because not every project made progress every week. Some of these projects were very difficult to do. Some of them were impossible to do. But what we did is with that number of projects, you could time cycle through them. You could work through one project and, and make good progress. And then you may have hit a dead end. I'm not really sure how to treat this data. I'm not sure where to get this data. I'm not sure if this data integrates with this other data set. So generally, people would read out what they were doing in the weekly readout, what, what, what they were working on for the week, and there would be patterns, discernible patterns. So you'd see somebody working on a forecasting problem. They'd be working on it for four or five months. And then they wouldn't have a readout on it for a week or two or three weeks. And I would know immediately, oh, they're stuck. Uh-oh, my computer just went, just went into hibernation. Hold on, I'm not even sure if I'm still there. We, uh, oh, we can hear you. Real. Okay. My screen just went blank. I'm like, oh, I guess I, I should move my cursor every now and then. So anyway, I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, so you wouldn't get a readout three, four weeks, something like that. So I'm like, I know what happened. They're stuck. You know, they've run into a roadblock. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there was an impending deadline, of course, I'm an executive and a manager and I would know that I would have to get involved. So then I would ask them, hey, you know, what's going on? And they would say, oh, I'm stuck. You know, I can't figure it out. But if you let them go and there wasn't an impending deadline, you weren't going to miss something, you know, in the next week or two, they would come back and say, you know, I was out riding my bicycle and I figured it out or I was taking a shower or I was walking my dog or, you know, whatever I was doing. And people would then figure it out. So you had all sorts of really interesting breakthroughs that were happening almost on a weekly basis. You know, people were were doing things with data that they had never done before. We, you know, we, we would, you know, you, of course you have to be a manager. You have to make sure that the trains run on time. I get that. But if you do set it up in a way that these people have enough work 
to move back and forth and move back and forth and not feel that they they're they're being you know beaten to get this stuff done you know by this date on this hour or whatever that you have some flexibility that the management has your back that will give you the support when you need it you know there are all sorts of really intriguing breakthroughs that happen so i'm a big believer in giving people more work than they could ever consider and giving them really hard problems that they think are impossible to solve. So, you know, it generally works out really well. You end up with a high degree of camaraderie. You end up with a lot of crosstalk between data scientists, a lot of collaboration. Um, so Adam, you want to say something? Yeah. Maybe we can do a little question session. Sure, sure, absolutely. <laughs> I just point a, uh, three points, yes. First is that you said that uh, you attract the audience to say, hey, I change analytic into dollars. So can you tell a little bit more about the measurement, about KPIs, about the way that it really affects the final uh, revenue? at the end of the year how the analytics sure. are that this is the yeah story. absolutely you know whenever when when i was running an analytics team in a, in a corporation we would always get an executive to be the the business sponsor and we would get subject matter experts to work on our team with us because we knew the data and the math and the analytics we didn't know the business so they would help us understand the business problem and whatever we did whatever we were going to improve or change we always equated it to money so if it was the EU, it was euros. If it was the United States, it was dollars. If it was Japan, it was yen. So in one case, we were building a forecasting system. And then we had extended that forecasting system to use it to optimize labor scheduling. And we did the calculations and we said, if the system works as it should, we should save $20 million a year in labor scheduling. And, and we told the business, we think that you can, we can, you can save $20 million. And they're like, mm, I don't know, it seems like a lot. We probably won't be able to do that. In the first year, we saved $35 million. So, you know, we look at what we're doing with analytics and we look at what we're going to change in the business and then we equate it to money. Are we going to, you know, be able to hire less people? Are we going to be able to do more processes? Are we going to be able to schedule labor better? So... You know, in my opinion, if you can't tie it to, you know, concrete bottom line business actions and business results, you shouldn't be building it. Okay. It's pretty convincing uh, based on the experience. Uh, the second point is uh, AI versus analytics. What for you do you think has a better possible return of investments? Do you believe so much in AI or are you a bit skeptic like uh, Elon Musk that we, sh we shouldn't invest too much in AI. It's not the way the mankind should go. Yeah. I'm not like Musk at all in many different many different respects. I, I've met Elon. I've ridden in the car with Elon a couple of times and I'm nothing like him. So I'll just say that at the outset. Uh, I'm pretty bullish on AI. I, I think AI works very well in, in certain cases. I think learning algorithms and learning approaches are fantastic. Uh, you have to be smart about how you manage the systems and manage, you know, drift and, and all the other model degradation and things like that. But I've seen lots of AI systems work very well. I've seen lots of statistical systems outperform them and work just as well. So I'm not pedantic about this split between analytics and AI. I look at the problem, the data and the improvement we want to make and then use the tool that makes the most sense for the, the use case. Okay. Uh, was it Tesla when you were driven with Elon or before Tesla? Uh, I used to, I, yeah, I used to run uh, a part of a conference where Elon came and he used to bring prototypes of Tesla cars. So we would drive the prototypes around with Elon and give him feedback about what we thought of it. Ah, okay. And, um, okay. So, uh, the last point is that I totally agree uh, with the operational roles that uh, uh, analytics demystify the black box. It is like a virtual cockpit and it really helps when it is stick together with the operational roles, especially the financial officers and operational officers. It all, I totally agree with, uh, with this. Okay, so um, maybe somebody else has questions or 
Marcin, you had your hand up there for a minute. Yeah, I mean, I really like what you are <laughs> describing. I mean, just a question to what you just said regarding the um, data analytics teams organization that you are. Uh, you said that Scrum does not work. Uh, no, it doesn't. Yeah, uh, and you you are fan of giving a lot of work to people and hard problems. Cool, I'm cool with that. Sounds great. But uh, what about the, this, maybe, I don't know, what about context switching, for example? How you approach this, this thing, yeah? When you have a lot of things to do on your plate, how? Well, you know, usually, usually what I, I think it's a great question. And what I've found is, is if you give people a lot of things to do, but you stress them out, you know, you make them think that they're failing or they have too much to do, then that's a real problem. You know, because people end up cycling, they end up context switching so much they don't get things done. Mm -hmm. But if you give them the support and you give them the, you know, the, the, the enough people around them, if you give them access to the subject matter experts and to the executives and to the managers who are their end users, when they get stuck, they generally go to them and say, hey, I'm having a real problem with this. I can't reach this level of, of accuracy or I can't make it work in this time frame and usually what happens is the the end users help them out of it you know when i was running my last team it, we would have a weekly meeting with everybody there was a big meeting everybody was in there everybody was talking and then they had a weekly meeting without me so what would happen is that you know i would do things i'm human i make mistakes all the time so i would do things that the team was unhappy about and they would talk about it amongst themselves. They're like, oh, I didn't like it when he did this, or this problem is impossible, or he gave too much work to this person, or whatever. And on a rotating basis, the team would nominate someone to come to me and say, hey, we're not happy with this. And I would say, okay, well, let's talk about it. And sometimes I would, I would admit, I'm like, oops, that was my bad, my mistake. I forgot about something that we had done before. Uh, so, you know, communication is the key. So you can give people a lot of work. That's not a problem but you have to give them the right environment to be supported. You have to let them talk to a lot of different people. You have to let them be frustrated. You have to let them give you feedback that, hey, you're making a mistake. Like, okay, great. And in some cases they'd say, you're making a mistake. And I would say, no, I'm not. In a couple months, you'll see that I'm right. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, you can give them a lot of work, but in the right environment where they're supported and have a lot of different resources at their disposal, I think it works out. Yeah, but this it, it sounds great actually, but to, to, to me it sounds like you gonna be this shield who will protect from some kind of external pressures and so on. Why am I I'm telling that? Because in the end you have some deadlines, you have some deliverables, products, and you have to somehow squeeze it somewhere well i'm not i'm not saying you're living in alice in wonderland or some kind of disney world yeah. you know you have to get things done yeah. you know and as the executive in charge of it i was responsible for things getting done so you know i would look out far enough and i would say to people is like hey you know you've got this one project that's in your portfolio you've got a delivery deliverable coming up in three months you know it looks like you need to time slice away from your other projects and focus here so you can hit your deadline Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, you know, if you go out on my LinkedIn profile and look at some of the testimonials from my previous employees, I did, I did shield them from a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure. I did shield them from, you know, executives coming down and yelling at them directly because that's not right. That's not the way it should work. I mean, they were, they were under pressure to deliver. It wasn't, you know, like sitting on a beach, but you know, none, nobody felt attacked. Nobody felt personally affronted. Everybody had plenty of time. And I certainly helped them hit their goals and their, and their objectives. So it's a collaboration. There's no doubt about it. Collaboration on top, uh, on this topic. So uh, it, it sounds also like a bit of engagement is needed from stakeholders here as well, right? Oh, for so, sure. So how you promote this, this attitude, how, how, yeah, what's your approach here? <laughs> yeah, we never we never undertook any projects unless we had an executive sponsor from the subject area. Logistics, marketing, sales, manufacturing, 
whatever it was. So we always, I always had a great relationship with all the executives and I would go to them and they would say, Hey, this is, this is my problem. You know, I need to acquire more customers or I need to get more donors through our donation centers or whatever it is. And I'd say, okay, well, let's talk through it. We talk through it and I'd say, we can help you. We can help you with that, but we need this subject matter expert. We need Danny or Alex or Adam or whoever to join our team and, and be part of the weekly updates and the weekly meetings and, and we'll work through it and we'll build a solution that's going to help you solve that problem. So when they, you know, when they were bought in and when they agreed that we were going to make measurable and, and innovative change in their area, they were there. If there were roadblocks about funding or if there was something like that, they were all bought in. It was, it was as much my, it was as much their project as it was mine. So they had people working on the team that were subject matter experts. We were doing the math and the data and we would show them, you know, continual. Now this sounds a little bit like agile. We called it nimble, but you know, in the beginning of a project, we would do an exploratory data analysis and often showing them how the business actually worked from a data perspective that was fresh, that was new, that was relevant. You got a lot of credibility from that. And people would often say, okay, fine, leave them, let them go, let them do whatever they're going to do. They've showed me how the business actually works. And many times their perception of how the business worked didn't line up with the reality of how it actually worked. So you're really helping them understand their business and how it really works at that time. So you gain a lot of credibility and a lot of, a lot of engagement and a lot of uh, partnership doing it that way. Yeah, it sounds like a re real collaboration. So, uh... well, let me let me ask let me ask. Uh, maybe we can take a poll here, or get some yeah. responses or whatever. I I worked in the CSL bearing, the second largest biopharmaceutical company, for four and a half years. I had a pretty significant data science team around the world: Europe, Australia, the United States. And over the four and a half years that I was there, how many data scientists did I lose? That's the question to the poll. That's the question. How many people quit over that four and a half years? 10%. That's a good guess, Robert. Thank you. None. Adam says none. That's very aggressive guess. Uh, I don't know. What a person a year. <laughs> Anybody else? Peter, I can see you on the screen. Zero. Zero. One. So Adam and Peter, you were the you were the closest. Was it you, John? <laughs> no, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Now we had we had a young lady who uh, was was wanted to go off and start a family, so she decided to leave data science and become a full time mother. So uh, based on my experience, I met Martin in, in Bank when I were in Gdańsk and uh, we had very similar structure uh, to what you proposed by our, our director Jens uh, from Germany. So he was like a spin doctor who was uh, very focused, you know, to get connect close connection with analytics in Bank. And, with PhD, MBA, and few other postgraduate studies, you know, so he's like, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, and maybe some ger ger German uh, uh, get yeah. get get is better, uh, and he drive it like uh, that. He built a team. Yes, you, you you said that there should be a two concurrent team, factory and like R and D group of you call call them artists, and we did very similar stuff. So it was like rotation of a team. There were a track for four projects every quarter. There could be a follow-up or we close project, the, the team rotation. There were meetings in every country with some budgets on airlines. And the goal was to build a new POC to bring a new value for the company. So it ends up with some MVP POC and then the stakeholders decided if they want to put more money to change it in product. Mm -hmm. So so it sounds 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 really familiar. Yeah, we we built a uh, a forecasting in that biopharmaceutical company that I keep referencing. They're they're all the raw material came from human plasma. So 
people donated their plasma in the 350 centers across the United States and, and in Germany and a few other European countries as well. Um, so we had we had built a forecasting system that forecasted the amount of plasma that would come into each center each day. But we built the infrastructure so we could forecast by the hour. And the first cut of the forecast was 18 months long, and we had, we had extended it out to 36 months. Um, and that's, you know, we used that. We showed it to the, to the team and they used it for their daily forecasts. But they ask us, why did you build it with such, you know, such granular data at the hourly level? Well, the, the version two, the extension of that system is what we used for the labor scheduling system. So we were always looking at systems that we could build version one for one purpose, version two for another purpose, version three for another purpose. So, you know, as analytics professionals, and I'm sure you're all fitting into this description and category here, we can see out further what we can do with data and math and analytics than end users can. You know, if you go and tell them, hey, I'm going to give you a better forecast, they're like, great. You know, if you come and talk to us and say, hey, I'm going to give you a better forecast, usually the, the, the question coming out of people's mouth is, what else can we do with it? You know, how can we extend that? How can we bring more data into it? How can we, you know, see further out into the future? So if you do it that way and you look at it that way, the end users tend to look at you differently. They're like, OK, he's going to build this thing now. I wonder what he's going to build next or what's going to come after that. And as long as you're delivering value on a consistent basis, people will stay engaged with you. You know, for us, an exploratory data analysis is very simple. You collect data, you look at the distributions, you look at the average, the means, the modes, all the different, you know, characteristics of the data and you show it to, you know, the end users and they think you've done magic. It's like, well, oh, not really. it's, this it's is not so simple. Magic. So, so you have to some kind of have story. Yes. So you need to measure something which is important That's instead right. of measuring anything. And yeah. also what you describe is uh, quite reasonable. So, so, but there are other types of companies. So, so for instance, you, you, you said about some, some kind of champion team mm -hmm. organization, which is, first of all, it requires some lot of safety, which is not a case mm -hmm. for small startup, not a case for, you know, low sure. margin business, short, uh, short term delivery, uh, you know, very constrained business mm -hmm. so so this is this is very very specific and also i very like what you said because this i actually was learning uh, at my university how to manage champion team and basically 95 percent what you said was what was i heard 15 years ago or 20 years ago and but also what what was missing to me because you mentioned that you you're trying to build system which scales in the future that's great but this is not a job for data people so you need to have some kind of uh, architects or system engineers or some visionaries mm -hmm. also, which means that you have a huge team with, with diversity and a lot of safety. It's a, I think it's a great environment to be, but also it, you need to provide a lot of value because, mm -hmm. because I, I remember project when we, when we got a customer who was super engaged and he just ordered like, I don't know, half million dollar per year. And the product was canceled because less than 10 millions is not enough yes right. so, so this is really also challenging but this is i think this is what you i, I need to read your books actually because it <laughs> looks like you have experience i i always thought to dream to to, to taste <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're absolutely right peter i mean it's you know i've i've run small teams i've i've raised you know i think i've raised over 150 million dollars in vc funds that was a long time ago I've run small startups. I've had my own, you know, startups that I started in my basement and all this other kind of stuff. What I'm talking about is an advanced analytics team in an enterprise context, in a world-class organization. Now, I, I've done this in this environment because I've done all the other things that you said. You know, I've worked on a shoestring. I've had, you know, projects that had to be done immediately. I've, you know, I've been on the hook to get something done within the next 24 hours. Those are not, that's not the environment I'm talking about. I'm talking about advanced analytics team in an enterprise context. So machine learning is also part of that. Yes. Yes. You know, my, my groups have always worked on 
from advanced statistics, predictive, prescriptive, simulation, and optimization. I've always worked in that area of the analytic spectrum or the AI spectrum, however you want to say it. That's great. So tell us more. So how, how you handle, let's say, the trans... So what I experienced in my, let's say, sm small career, some people who are very experienced, they may hide a knowledge because they you know they are these the, the people who who solve the issue so they they want they don't want to share 100 percent and and sometimes this is a real problem because yeah. it's very hard to to if you are below if you are junior or mid you ask for some sharing and and they just don't don't give you the the whole picture how you address this kind mm -hmm. of uh, ego problems and yeah yeah the star yeah. i don't know how to call it great question great question it's a, it's in a building analytics team so when you buy it you'll you'll get that part of the vignette as well um i i call those people jerks um you know brilliant jerks i think is how i describe them in the book um my approach is to fire them i love it <laughs> We saw that I think I, I think we missed that on our team, Piotr. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't I don't like working with people like that. You know, uh, you know, I, I share everything I know with everybody that I know. So, you know, I, I, I'm not the most brilliant mathematician. I'm probably not the best modeler in the world. But, you know, I've done it. I've done it successfully. And I'm happy to share everything I know with anybody that's on my team and, and people that are not on my team at any time. If you ask me a question, I'll answer it straight. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you that too. But if, if we have people on our teams that are retentive with their knowledge, retentive with their skills, retentive with ways to help the organization, then they're not helping us. They're actually hindering us. And they should, you know, I, I have a belief and I've stood up in front of uh, almost every organization I've ever run. And I've said to people, I said, look, if you don't like what you're doing, then come and talk to me and we will help you find a role in the organization that you would enjoy more or we'll help you leave, you know, because you're in a job that someone else would love to have and you're not happy. So you're not happy. They're not happy. You're making me somewhat unhappy. So, you know, let's all just be open with each other. If you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. This is a choice that we all have. And it's not like if you're going to come to me and say, I'm unhappy, I'm going to fire you the next day. I'm not a, a, a barbarian. You know, what I want is I want people to be enjoying their work. And if you're doing good work and you're being productive, but you're unhappy, then let's find a way to make you happy. Let's, like I said, find you another role in the organization. Let's help you move out of the organization to another company. I really think that there's a job for everybody out there. I really do believe that. One more short question. Uh, yeah, John, just for your information, uh, Peter Peter has a few years more experience than me, and he's a great debater, actually. I, I, I wish to work one day with him. He was for many years a veteran in Intel. But he was, you know, the guy who was taken by the director of the office of Inter Poland to every conference due to his curiosity and to spy, you know, the competitions. <laughs> <laughs> if you know, okay. uh, one role. You are. But, but, you but now Peter is in startup. Yes, in Silicon Valley startups area. He was architect also. So I think he, uh, he his CV is, is brilliant. But I'm glad, Peter, that you said you said the similar. Uh, uh, what I said before when I met John, that I bought I bought his book. It's pretty good. Um, or, already read like 70% of it. So we, we can share, but uh, I, I really recommend it. Is, is it it's good book to start your career or in the mid of career or even in the end of career. To read. It's been it's been kind of surprising that a lot of the book is being that the building analytics team book it has been bought by college students. It, it seems to be hugely popular with with people that are in their undergraduate studies. And I ask people when I go to speak and, and do book signings and I meet these younger people, I ask them, I said, why are you buying this book? 
And they're like, well, you know, data science is really exciting and fun and interesting, but we have no idea what the working world looks like. And we think we might be able to learn something from your experience. So it's, it's been a book that a lot of young people have bought just so they have an idea that, you know, maybe they don't want to be in data science, you know, they just don't have no idea. So the book's been helping them understand if it makes sense for them or not. I, I will give you one story, John. So I, we have a in Poland, we have a quite strong community of people who, who attend this inform computer science Olympiads. Mm -hmm. And I know quite a bunch of them. I also attended a few. So I, I will tell you about two of them. So one of them called me like three months ago and he just started a new job. And he told me, Piotr, I discovered something. I, I, sh I, when I did something, I always write, uh, read me how I did it, what I did it step by step, how to understand, always. And, and guess what? Nobody no one is it. no one is doing this in that company yeah. and if i do it they cannot complain that i did some magic and i don't share but also they don't understand it and he know he knows because they don't ask valid questions he know because he wrote it so so basically what happened you, you, he behaved like a super open person because he is from this community of people who are very high attitude and and it, you cannot play this game with them they they, they they see this in the moment yes and he play with regular people and they don't they he don't it's not compatible but on the other hand it's also super discovery that this is what what he's doing and another one he that that was very really curious I, I travel with random person and he talked about my friend who is teaching on the university one of these olympiad people and he said this is the only the only teacher in his life who admit when he he don't know something that this is, is very like, hard for professors to do <laughs> yes and this is something like i know these people from olympias and they have no problem to say i don't know i failed this is because they know they they compete every day every month every they have these championships and and they know they are not always 100 percent accurate Absolutely. And, and, and and the, these other people they they don't they don't even how to apply to this level which is to me somehow this is bizarre behavior because because when i was working at intel i was giving people chance like okay i see you don't understand the baseline i will give you like i will give you hints what to read and and most of them most of them were refusing because it was like discovering their lack of knowledge in, the, in that process yes if if i say okay i will meet with you every week one hour and i will show you what to read how will help you understand what are the baseline of our problem and people refused this offer i was shocked because it's surprising when people say that yeah yeah it's it, you know it really is interesting you know when you when you're working with people who are highly intelligent and know it they're very open and they share and they admit when they don't know things. You know, if you're working with people who are somewhat smart and insecure, they'll never admit they don't know something. Yep. Uh, another question, uh, John, about drug discovery. It's getting more and more popular, yes? There is uh, some money to save for this. Yeah. Big pharmaceutical businesses to speed up the process. There are even a tracks on a conference. Uh, what is your point of view about this drug discovery? How, how, do, how do you like it? Did you yeah. engage with previous company in this uh, sector? Are no, you we you know we we tried to do some things in this sector, but it, the company wasn't ready for it. You know, we tried to introduce some advanced uh, computational biology and pattern matching, which would have been really useful for them because everything that they do with the human plasma is about extracting certain kinds of proteins from it. And there are untold number of, of undiscovered proteins in human blood and human plasma. Um, I, I think there's a great future in comp computational biology and, and drug discovery. I think it's huge. Um, it's complicated and, it, and it's hard to do, but you know, if it was easy, everybody would do it and it wouldn't be any fun. Uh, but yeah, I think there's a, a, a very broad future in that. We have like 12 more minutes to full hour, but maybe some other, co our colleagues has questions. The hidden one. Ah. I, I have one more. So, so you wrote a few books. Yes. And this is something I always thought there will be day in the future that I can draft a book 
and computer can wrote a book by me. And, and I, I think we now close to that point. Yes. So yes. do you, what do you think about all of this GPT, all of this, I don't know how to call it movement. Oh, I think GPT is great. I think it's a fantastic invention. Uh, you know, you have to be careful. It's not, you know, it's not everything comes out of it is true. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I, I think it's fabulous. I and mean, people say, oh, it's going to threaten your book writing and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm like, mm, no, I don't think so. It'll be fine. So yeah, I, uh, I, I think it's, I think there's great promise in, in large language models. I'm excited about them. We're doing a lot with them here at EY. But have you tried to write a chapter with, with only drafting the content and filling with chat? No, because I like to write. Okay. I don't need, I don't need a, uh, I don't need a model to write for me. I like to write. So like I said, I wrote a hundred thousand words in three months. So, you know, production of words is not my, not my problem. Hi, uh, I have the question regarding books. Uh, because there is the saying when you put something onto the paper, you can learn from from this because it helps you organize your thinking. And did you came up with some ideas while you were writing a book, came up with some ideas about management, organization, like maybe there was this aha moment regarding something, or did you learn something from the feedback that you get from the readers of the book? Yeah, the readers are great. Um, it's been a wonderful joy for me to have so many people around the world commenting on my book and asking me questions. And, you know, when I wrote the Building Analytics Teams book, I, I as Adam said, I, I fully expected it for, to be for mid-career professionals. I never thought early stage professionals would be interested at all or people wanting to get into the field. So, uh, that's been a really interesting learning experience. My third book, Data for All, actually releases tomorrow. I kind of forgot about that. <laughs> and then I'm uh, I'm writing a fourth book on causal AI right now. So, yeah, engaging with your audience is is just wonderful. They really they really help you understand uh, you know what uh, what's going on. Causal inference, you wrote something on this topic? That's a new book from you? Yeah, I completely forgot. You know, I've got so much stuff going on, I'm forgetting what I'm doing at this point. So yeah, the new the new book, Data for All, is, it's on Amazon and, it, and I think it starts shipping tomorrow, so. It's a very small book, it's a primer. Probably not for you guys, for the people here. It's It's mostly for non-technical readers to understand what happens to your data when you go on Facebook or you use an application or, you know, you you allow an organization to use your data for all different purposes. I think it's about time that the, the, the general population understood the data ecosystem at a deeper level. So I wrote a very slim book that's easy to read about that. All right. Well, I've really enjoyed my time. Thank you for inviting me. I hope you've uh, enjoyed the conversation and uh, I'm going to have to pop off. I've got a few different fires that are brewing in the background, so I got to go spend some time on my day job. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank Thanks you. A lot. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye, everybody. Bye.